You're listening to The World at Eight with Lynn Mozart. The World at Eight, the number one in nationalist news. Highlights of the news today, Friday the 16th of November. Conservative MP backs BNP fears of years ago. Abu Qatada to be monitored from outer space. Illegal immigrants captured after overstaying their welcome. From Nick Griffin, MEP on barbed wire and more. The Egyptian Prime Minister has travelled to Palestine. A shipment of cylinders for missiles has been seized. Thought for the day. Oh, what lies we weave. And finally, do not feed the horses. UK News. UK Conservative MP's factual remark that gangs of Muslims are raping white kids has caused leftist dimmy heads to explode. A row has erupted after Keithley MP Chris Hopkins claimed gangs of Muslim paedophile men are going around and raping white kids, fuelled by a cultural background that encourages brutal sexism against all women. While calling for greater openness on the subject during a House of Commons debate, Mr Hopkins made extreme accusations which exceeded former MP Anne Cryer's remarks on race and sex abuse in Keithley. Tonight a fierce row was raging as some community leaders said the former Bradford Council leader's remarks were outrageous. UK media schmucks used the politically correct term Asians instead of Muslims. Keithley Central Councillor Kadim Hussein, Labour, said Mr Hopkins was playing to the BNP and the far right with this sort of thing. Former Labour MP Anne Cryer said she felt Mr Hopkins' comments were heavy-handed, but supported much of what he said. Dr Barry Malik of the Bradford-based Amadea Muslim Association said he thought Mr Hopkins' comments were outrageous and a disgrace. Lord Patel of Bradford said, Generally, I echo what Chris Hopkins says. This is not all about Pakistani men. It is a minority, but it is there, and it needs to be addressed. A BNP spokesman commented, Too little, too late. But at least this creature had the guts to say something. Perhaps they should do to him what they did to our leader and try and get him locked up. Abu Qatada's every movement will be watched from space as part of the massive surveillance operation that is costing the public £5 million a year. On top of this, Qatada is demanding to be rehoused at the taxpayer's expense less than 12 months after being moved to his current home. Lawyers for the extremist cleric revealed he and his family, who live on state handouts, have asked to be relocated. It is not known what reasons he has given, but he is likely to have demanded more space or complained about the constant media presence outside, and now the government is getting just a little rattled. Hate preacher Katada 51 will cost taxpayers £100,000 a week to monitor around the clock. That is on top of the £3 million bill he has already totted up in legal aid, fees, benefits, prison and security costs. And if he stays here for just another two years, the total bill will grow to £13.4 million. Mr Anderson, a government official, said we could be looking at months or even years. As this presenter says, oh, who will rid us of this mad cleric? Once again, illegal immigrants and students, especially those from the Indian subcontinent, have been caught overstaying their welcome at the expense of the British taxpayer. Five illegal Indians have been detained after the UK border agency officials swooped on an egg production facility, Landshire County Foods, near Wincanton in Dorset. Landshire faced a fine of up to £50,000. A 20-year-old man was working in breach of the conditions of his student visa. A 24-year-old and a 48-year-old had overstayed their visas. And a 39-year-old and 45-year-old were found to have entered the UK illegally. They are currently at immigration detention centres and face removal from the UK. A World Date reporter commented, The blame must not be borne by the immigrants totally, but by the greedy British employers who want cheap, illegal labour. (music) 
I hand you over to Nick Griffin, NEP, who is discussing barbed wire, Europe and very much more. Another week, another wave of rioting in Greece and, for a change, Portugal, as the Euro dream slides a little further down the slippery slope to nightmare. I've just heard on the radio that the entire EU is now officially back in recession. Believe me, there's worse, much worse, still to come. But I've got even better news than that from Europe for you this week. In Spain, our friends in the Plataforma per Catalonia are continuing in their ambitious campaign to win their first ever regional parliamentary seat in the crisis-hit ancient province. The outright separatists there are as crazily far left and anti-white as the Scottish National Party are over here. Plataforma merely want a further measure of local self-government to bring government closer to the people. They also stand for a complete halt to the third world immigration flood that has turned Spain from a European nation into a demographic disaster area with immigrants now making up nearly one in five of the population in less than 20 years. Plataforma's growing appeal is partly based too on their policies to protect and rebuild Spanish industry and their rejection of the global free trade disaster imposed by international corporations through their puppets in the corrupt political elite. Together with their firm opposition to involvement in any more neocon wars, Plataforma are very much our kind of party. The election is on the 25th of November, and it's the first time in modern Spanish history that any nationalist party has been in with the chance of winning parliamentary seats. If they manage it, it will be another vitally important sign that the nationalist star is rising again. You know, it really would be a big step forward something recognised by both the Flemish Vlaams Belang and the Austrian Freedom Party, both of whom are actively helping them. I hope to speak at a meeting for them next weekend as well. Meanwhile, keep your fingers crossed, or, if you're a Catholic, say a prayer for Spain, the nation whose sacrifice over hundreds of years did so much to throw back the Islamic tide from Europe. The changing shape of Spanish politics is, of course, just part of a far bigger fallout from the impact of the financial crisis. It has long been the boast of the Europhiles that the EU abolished war in Europe. That is, needless to say, a lie. The exhaustion and wisdom that came from the two rounds of slaughter that began in August 1914 were far more important reasons for peace. That, and the little fact of the threat of nuclear mutually assured destruction, if anyone was daft enough to kick off again. War, sadly, is part of the human condition, so any statement of intention to abolish it is a sign either of monstrous stupidity, flatulent demagoguery, as in the war to end all wars, or the hubristic pride that so often goes before a fall. The latter seems to fit the EU the best. For while the Eurocrats could never abolish war, the signs are that they may turn out to have changed its nature for a few years. At the height of the insane folly of the First World War, the evil genius Lenin called on Russians to turn the war into civil war. Looking at the riots, petrol bombs, broken glass and cracked skulls that are now routine across southern Europe, I'm reminded of the hardcore Marxist origins of Commissioner Barroso and many Eurocrats. Are they still obeying Lenin? Even if it were true that they've abolished war between nation states in Europe, the history of the next decade will almost certainly prove that they've not abolished war within nations. Rich against poor, black against white, Muslim against Kaffir, peasants against the Euro elite and their European army that they freely admit does not exist to be used outside Europe. So what's it for then? I think you know the answer already. Civil war. That's what the EU will give us. War between civilians, between communities. An evil often even worse than war between standing armies, for it has no rules except kill them and theirs before they kill you and yours. Walking the approaches to the Brussels Parliament last week and this, it looked as if the Europhile preparations are already quite well advanced. Because the place is surrounded with portable steel and barbed wire crowd control fences, topped with razor wire. It's eerily reminiscent of the first days of the Berlin Wall, when communist police and soldiers erected the temporary barriers that divided Germany for 28 years. They'll probably take it down for a while, but the precedent has been set. So it will be steadily easier for the Eurocrats to order the erection of barriers designed to help keep the enthusiastic and grateful masses at a safe distance. I tracked down a Union flag in a strange little shop in Brussels and hung it, suitably ripped and torn, on the sinister Euro wire. I've got some cracking pictures of it for future use. They pretty much sum the whole thing up. 
as a sign of the incredible power of social networking. Simon Darby called me from Wales within minutes to tell me that people had posted tweets that they'd seen me taking photographs of a Union Jack draped on Parliament's barbed wire. There are so many things I can't do in public. Fortunately, that's not one of them. On the subject of things that shouldn't be done in public, or anywhere else for that matter, the British establishment's paedophile crisis took another lurch towards blanket disgrace this week. While an abrupt about turn by his long-term accuser, left Lord McAlpine, an innocent man, and the BBC in even more disarray than before, there came news of the arrest of another BBC celebrity, Dave Lee Travis, and the news that the Crown Prosecution Service had rejected and MI5 had buried a thick file of young victim statements exposing the late Liberal MP for Rochdale, Cyril Smith. Smith's pederast chain was an open secret in Rochdale and in the entire political establishment for decades. But how could the Tories expose it when, in 1974, Smith was tipped to become a minister in a conservative liberal coalition led by Ted Heath, the Euro traitor for whom Tim Jimmy Savile used to procure young boys. As for the Labour Party, just Google Operation Or, or Harriet Harman, NCCL, Pedophile Information Exchange, or Hackney Children's Homes and Trotter, to give you just three examples of Labour's deeply twisted position on pederasty. Of course, not all establishment and Labour corruption is about sex. Money plays a crucial role too. It was money, or rather lust for it, that, with a bit of help from the BNP, brought down Dennis McShane, triggering the by-election in Rotherham that we're fighting hard right now. We've got a great local candidate in Marlene Guest, who in the early 90s played a major role in the exposure and jailing of corrupt Labour councillors in the town. Stealing £172,000 from an anti-poverty charity and blowing it on expensive meals, booze, hotels and prostitutes is bad even by the normal low standards of champagne socialists. So now Labour has a real fight on its hands. Our presence, combined with local anger over Muslim grooming gangs targeting English girls, forced their national executive to deselect the male Muslim favoured by the Pakistani tribal bloc that dominates the local party. So many Labour activists are defecting to George Galloway's far-left Muslim respect, which is pouring activists from Bradford into the Muslim parts of town. Meanwhile, on the English estates, a Guardian reporter yesterday found no one voting Tory or UKIP, but plenty of support for the British National Party. Labour's 11th hour dash to hold off respect and BNP was the headline in the paper. Knowing how vulnerable they are to a prolonged campaign, Labour have called this as another snap election. So we have just two weekends in which to make our presence felt. So I hope that you will do everything you can to help, either by coming to help Marlene in person or by donating to support the campaign. Rotherham is a great opportunity to take the propaganda lies of those who said that we were a fortnight away from collapse two years ago and shove them down their throats. The civic nationalist traitors in the Muslim candidate fielding English Democrats and the gay rights obsessed British Freedom Party both suffered predictably disastrous results in yesterday's police commissioner elections. So now we can prove once and for all that the British National Party has not only just recovered financially and organisationally, but also politically. We really are the only nationalist game in town again, so let's get out and play. Till next week, remember, freedom is never free, and our time is coming. Thank you, Nick. You've given us all something to think about over the weekend. World News. The Egyptian Prime Minister has travelled to Palestine to express his country's support over the recent bombings by Israel on Palestinian targets. The Israelis fired 130 missiles into Palestine's capital Gaza as retaliation to the 11 rockets fired at Israel earlier, which killed three people in the block of flats that was targeted. A halt to the fighting due to the Egyptian Prime Minister's visit has begun. A World Date spokesperson stated, You can see who is fanning the flames here. Our media are only showing the Palestinian wounded and ignoring the Israeli dead. Egypt is ruled by Muslim fundamentalists, which doesn't help. And you can see the Muslim world is boiling up to bomb Israel out of existence, as they have promised to do. The West and the UN are not damping down the problem, they are escalating it to suit their purpose. Put that madman Ahmadinejad in with it and you have a very nasty situation developing. 
and poor old England will no doubt send more boys to die in another Muslim hellhole. A large shipment of around 450 missile cylinders, used to make missiles for a possible ballistic category of weapon, has been seized by South Korean officials. The ship carrying the cylinders was a Chinese vessel which was carrying the cargo from North Korea, travelling to Syria. The parts were ordered by a Syrian company called Electric Parts. China claims it knows nothing about the cargo and has promised a full investigation into the matter. The arrangements for the transportation of the cylinders was organised by a North Korean shipping company. The United Nations has placed a ban on any nuclear missile parts or information to leave North Korea. Thought for the day. Oh, what lies we weave when we stoop to deceive. I always thought that British justice was the best in the world, until fairly recently. The awful cover-ups of the Muslim grooming epidemic, so long ignored by the authorities, culminating in the terrible Charlene Downs case, which has been highlighted by us for many years, but hidden from the public by the media. Then there is the media cover-up of the case of young Robert Fleeting, who presumably hung himself after suddenly becoming gay after a few drinks off base at RAF Benson in Oxfordshire. Now we have the Muslim grooming furor in the news again because a Tory MP, Mr Hopkins, claimed Gangs of Muslim men are going around raping white children. Some Muslim men are fundamentally sexist and only want subservient women. That some Muslim boys are raised as little princes who can do no wrong and so lack morals that some imams behave brutally to children in Keithley's mosques. Mr Hopkins said he was not saying all British Pakistani men are abusing white kids, but he went on to add, there is a large minority though. A fact, my friends, all of which Nick Griffin, the British National Party, pro Fam, me and many other nationalists have been saying for years. I have met Shaquille Aziz, who runs anti-grooming workshops for young men in Keithley, and he is firmly in the deny, divide and conquer brigade of Muslims, and label Mr Hopkins as wrong to identify abusers as Muslim when the background of their crimes had little to do with religion. This is, of course, a load of pig's bollocks, with very few exceptions. All the guys brought to court, and there are precious few of them, are Muslim. You still never see the whole page spreads wholly devoted to youngsters ruined by these bastards, even if they survive. Their very short stories are submerged in with sex slaves and run-of-the-mill paedophiles, not the Jimmy Savile style, and Eastern European gangs and our own black gangs. Even then, the religion of our Muslim groomers is never mentioned as Muslim. Just Asian, which is of course an ethnicity, not a religion. I have written and spoken many times on the reason why these young men and boys turn to such nasty forms of sexualization of our very young girls, and it is all based on their religion, which of course is a tenet of their land, not our land, and their family's attitude and behaviour towards their indigenous hosts, namely, seemingly friendly, but underneath contemptuous of the hand that feeds them. You will only see a change in their behaviour and their way of operating in this country when we see a change in our media and the government confront the issue and put them firmly in their place, which hopefully gives them the chance to give their allegiance to a country more suited to their needs. We are, however, very good at covering up all sorts of crimes and seemingly the mixture of the armed forces and homosexuality is just one facet. Up to this liberal age, unless you were an Ottoman mercenary or in the ancient Greek army, it was frowned upon to have homosexuals as soldiers. Now, of course, with the common purpose rules striding over our land, the RAF, Army and Navy seem to want to recruit them to show how liberal they are, or it might be to get more lottery money, I don't know. Now, young Robert Fleeting, 24, was not a homosexual. He was a Scot from East Kilbride, serving at RAF Benson as a firefighter. He came from a caring home and was engaged to Max in Menhemet, 19. The last time Maxine saw Robert, he gave her £350 to put down on a wedding dress and the following day Maxine attended a family wedding and Robert went on a night out. It was the last night out he ever had. There is an investigation supposedly going on with the IPCC which has been demanded by his parents, Susan and Charlie Fleeting, so I must be cautious here. But a Facebook campaign has been launched and joined by over 11,000 people. 
The facts of his death are just too strange and differ too greatly from this young man's character and from the man that his friends and family knew not to be looked into. Wearing my profam hat, I've been in touch with his mother, Susan, and I feel for her. There is nothing as daunting as the British establishment when it gets the bit between its teeth and a cover-up is underway. To sum up a few facts, Robert went out that night with friends and colleagues. There was a drunken altercation between what the police named the other male throughout the police report. This apparently ended good-naturedly when they all returned to base. This other male, who was allowed to refuse to give a formal statement to the police during those first hours, was a known homosexual medic called Ryan Charlton. He claimed that they had consensual sex. It was in Charlton's room that Robert's mobile phone was found. Robert's body has now been cremated, but evidence of abuse was found on the body during a post-mortem. The rolled-up curtain supposedly used by Robert to hang himself was a ring donut bandage commonly used by medics in Iraq and Afghanistan, and Robert would have had no knowledge of how to tie this item. This was not told to the parents. The investigating officer took it on himself to ignore the investigations of the post-mortem for date rape drugs because they released the body to the family too soon for cremation, which is another way of covering up a crime. It is unclear whether the suicide notes found were actually written by Robert. Robert was a ladies' man, not a closet homosexual. His father, who is ex-military himself, and his fiancée believe that Robert might have killed himself after an encounter with Charlton, but that he was raped or assaulted under duress. There are two possible scenarios. Robert was raped whilst drugged, then strangled with his particular knot and left in his room. His socks are still missing and his mobile phone was left in the room of Charlton. Robert was found on the floor of his bedroom, not hanging at the time. Another possibility is that he woke up from being assaulted and hung himself, still leaving his mobile phone in another room, writing copious notes and still missing his socks. It seems that the investigations have been sketchy and that the RAF is covering up the whys and wherefores of this young man's tragic demise. It really stinks. I would think if you were a young fellow, slightly drunk or drugged or both, and you woke up having been violently assaulted, enough to leave internal bruising, would your first thought be suicide? Was Charlton there at the time? Investigations have taken Charlton's word that he left the room. So why were Robert's personal effects, including his phone, left in another room? Personally, I feel that this suicide, rape or murder, or all three, has been covered up in the best possible way, by way of appearing ignorant and stupid. It is criminal that a young man working for the establishment can undergo trauma and death, and no one actually cares what really happened apart from his traumatised relatives. There should be a full investigation carried out and quickly, if only for the sake of his good name, his family and Maxine, his fiancée. This investigation should be as huge and public as the various disgusting gropings carried on 40 years ago by a certain celebrity, which is due to reach the giddy heights of money changing hands, a legal first for an old grope or groper, I feel. What about Robert and others in his position in the armed forces? Their names have not warranted fame. How about the poor little girls? And I do not mean the ones who gloatingly only go out with parkies, stupids. I mean the youngsters who have been murdered recently and who might have well have been killed in the last 30 years that these Muslims have been preying on them. Who will say their names in the Book of the Dead? Who will stand up and be counted for these innocents? Only us, the reviled British National Party. But you know, you know what they say, every dog has his day. And I hope that that day will not come over the bodies of our innocent young men and women. It is a sad day for a country when the powers favour the odd and perverted to deny justice to what is right and good in society. Let us hope that the IPCC do their job for Robert Fleeting and that the government do their job in protecting our young girls and our culture and religion, as indeed they are paid to do. And finally, don't feed the horses. Yup, it could only happen in politically correct Britain. 
As if we do not have enough trouble getting rid of preachers of hate, we are now prosecuting men who feed sausage rolls to police horses. It's true. A man who gave a police horse a sausage roll is facing court proceedings. He's been accused of behaving in a threatening or abusive manner. In this thankfully rare case, Francis Kelly, 41, has been charged with causing a breach of the peace in Glasgow earlier this year. Apparently he ignored police warnings and gave the pastry to the animal because he thought the horse looked hungry. Critics said the case was a waste of money and questioned why it was being brought before the courts next year. Prosecutors will allege that on September the 28th, Mr Kelly behaved in a threatening and abusive manner by attempting to feed meat to the horse. This presenter says that the police should take the same stance over the G8 bastards who hit police horses or the IRA who blew them up. Are they nothing better to do? You have been listening to The World at Eight. I am Lynn Mozart and I and the team at Radio Britain wish you all a very happy and safe weekend. <laughs>